Our gracious and eternal Father, as we uh, come before you this morning to uh, once again open the sacred word of truth, we know that it would be in vain um, that we study this morning without the aid of your Holy Spirit. And so we once again ask that you would uh, breathe upon us this morning, uh, that we would receive the light and power uh, from the most holy place, but also that we might receive the experience of the sweet love, joy, and peace uh, that you desire to give to us as your children. Father, this morning we just continue to pray that the seed of truth would find a place within our hearts uh, and that we as your people would be diligent to remove all of the stones, uh, the weeds, the sins uh, that does so easily beset us, uh, that we might be able to be firmly rooted and grounded upon your word and upon the truths of your word. And we thank you so much for what you are doing for us here at the end of time. And we just pray that, you, uh, that we as your people would be called, chosen, and faithful as we go forth uh, to proclaim this message uh, that you have given to us. So bless us this morning. May your spirit be with uh, my thoughts and my words. And Lord, may you speak through me. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to say good morning to each and every one of you. It's a blessing to uh, be here once again sharing the words of truth, the words of life. And uh, the Word of God is just, uh, it, it, it's a blessing to be able to study and for the Lord to be able to open up things to your understanding, uh, things that you had not seen before. And just to see the, uh, the continuity uh, of the Bible, how it just, it's all together. There's a harmony uh, that runs through uh, the scriptures, and it's very, very, uh, very, very powerful uh, as we study. Um, yesterday, yesterday evening, for the evening worship, we started the subject of the daily controversy between Christ and Satan. And what we did with this particular subject is we began to trace the spirit of the daily, the spirit of self-exaltation, Gadol. Uh, we traced it. We, we saw that it began in heaven with Lucifer. The Bible says that he wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. We saw that this spirit uh, was the, the, the spirit of this or the foundation of this spirit was the spirit of pride, uh, self-sufficiency, um, stubbornness. Uh, these were the traits of character that we saw in the word of God yesterday. And we saw that this, these principles of Satan, we defined that word principle, and we saw that that word principle meant the ground or foundation, the origin. Uh, we saw that this, the principle of Satan's kingdom is Gadol, or self-exaltation, the, the spirit of paganism, a system of worship. We also saw uh, that word principle, what it meant. And we saw that the principles of Satan's kingdom are warring against the principles of God's kingdom. And we located in the scriptures last night what uh, the principle of God's kingdom is, uh, is. We saw that it was love and how God's kingdom is based upon the principle of self-sacrificing love. And we saw that Satan's kingdom is based upon self, uh, stubbornness, pride. And as a result of these two principles clashing in heaven, we saw in the book of Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, we saw that there was war in heaven. And this was a war of principles. It was also a, a war as well. Uh, we saw this war taking place in heaven and we saw that as a result of Satan's rebellion against God, uh, because this spirit of self-exaltation and pride, it leads to rebellion. That's what it leads to. And as a result of Satan's rebellion, we saw he was cast out to the earth, the Bible told us. And then we began to trace the spirit of paganism, the spirit of self-exaltation, the spirit of pride throughout the scriptures. And we saw the first manifestation uh, we saw it manifesting in the Garden of Eden with Eve. We saw Eve uh, coveting that which God had given to, um, that which was God's alone. And that was the, uh, the uh, right to know or the, the desire to know good and evil. We saw that Eve believed that, she believed the lie of Satan and she believed that as she ate this fruit, we read in the Spirit of Prophecy, that she attained to a higher sphere. Um, and so... Uh, we see the, the spirit that Satan had in heaven, the spirit or the desire for self-exaltation. That spirit, in fact, we learned last night that it was the spirit of covetousness, the spirit of lusting after this knowledge 
uh, that corruption entered into the world. This is where, uh, this is how the world was corrupted. Then we began to trace it. We, we saw it in the Garden of Eden, and then we traced it to Cain and Abel. And we saw the same spirit, the spirit of Gadol, manifesting itself there. We saw that Cain, uh, how did he manifest his spirit? He uh, brought the works of his own hands, the fruit of the ground. He was a tiller of the ground, and this is the offering that he brought before God. And we saw that he desired that his works be accepted before God, even though he knew the sacrifice that God had required of him. In fact, we, we read a statement. In fact, I'll just read that statement again just so that we can see and be on track with what we're doing today because th this is what we're doing. We're just tracing the Spirit all throughout uh, the Scriptures. We saw here... It says, uh, just the point that's emphasized and underlined here, it says, He permitted, speaking of Cain, his mind to run in the same channel that led to Satan's fall, indulging the desire for self-exaltation and questioning the divine judgment, justice, and authority. So, Sat or so Cain now is carrying that spirit of Gadol. He's carrying the spirit of self-exaltation, of pride, of self-sufficiency. He's carrying that spirit, the spirit of the dragon. In fact, we saw in uh, Genesis chapter 4 that Cain was very wroth and his countenance was fallen. And we located in the Bible another power who was very wroth. And that was the dragon in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. The Bible says that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And we see that Cain manifested the same spirit. He was very wroth. His countenance fell. And who did he go to make war against? He made war against Abel, his brother. So once again, the spirit of pride, the spirit of Gadol, the spirit of self-exaltation is manifested upon this earth. Then we see, then we trace this spirit to uh, Babel. And we saw how that God, uh, he came down and he confounded the languages because there was a certain individual uh, who was the builder of Babel. Who was this individual? His name was Nimrod. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 10 that Nimrod was a mighty hunter against the Lord. He, and it mentions it twice. So it, it, God's word is establishing that Nimrod was against him. Uh, the Bible uses the word before, but when you look if you, or if you have a margin in your Bible, it means against God. He was against God. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. We saw last night that Babel, the Tower of Babel was... Uh, we looked at it several things. I'm not going to go over everything, but I'm just kind of giving us a little recap here uh, so that we can uh, pick up from where we left off last night. But the Tower of Babel was, uh, it says down here, the magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders. So this tower, once again, the works of the hands of the people was their pride. They were, that was their pride. That was something that they, they, they desired to be uh, exalted by, the works of their hands. And we saw this was a direct correlation or a direct parallel to the towers that were in New York City. Sister White uses the same language. She says those towers that went up story after story were designed to be a monument to um, to its builders, to those that made these things. And we know what happened to the towers in New York and we know what happened to this tower as well. Uh, they fell. Then we trace this spirit of self-exaltation to Egypt. And we saw how Pharaoh exalted himself against God. And I'm not, not Pharaoh, but yes, Pharaoh. He exalted himself against God. And he said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? We saw him making commandments against the people of God, specifically a commandment against the Sabbath of God. And uh, him telling Moses, listen, you, you want the people to rest from their burdens. That word rest is the Hebrew word Shabbat, uh, which means Sabbath rest. Uh, so he makes a commandment against the Sabbath. We also see him trying to uh, exterminate the people of God, killing all the baby boys uh, there in, against the children of Israel in Egypt at that particular time. So we, we trace it to Pharaoh in Egypt. And then we brought it down to... Uh, the next nation or kingdom in Bible prophecy, and that was the kingdom of Babylon. And we saw that this spirit of self-exaltation in Babylon was manifested through Nebuchadnezzar, but it was also manifested through uh, Belshazzar, his grandson, and that the pride of Babylon 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up, the Bible says, and also Belshazzar's heart was lifted up as well. And we saw the counsel that Daniel gave to Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. In fact, let's just look at this real briefly, and we're going to pick it up from here as we continue to study this morning. Notice what it says, and we're just capping off this study, and then we're uh, the study of the daily, but we're going to bring it home to us in the series of studies that we're going to do right after this. So notice what your Bible says here in Daniel chapter 4, uh, because we're talking about this spirit of pride, self-exaltation, uh, the spirit of questioning God, questioning his justice, questioning his authority. This, this is the spirit of Gadol. Uh, we see here in the book of Daniel chapter 4, looking specifically at verse 27, Daniel gives counsel to the king. And notice what that counsel is. He says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. I want you to keep these words in your mind, because we're going to see this later on in our studies later on today, okay? The study after this, and the study following that as well. But Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, break off your sins by righteousness, okay? And what was the sin of Nebuchadnezzar? Because what was the dream about? It was about this tree, okay? And this tree provided for the whole earth, but Daniel, uh, God was trying to show Nebuchadnezzar in the vision that God was giving you, God has given you this kingdom once again. But we see that as we continue to read the scriptures there, it says, And all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Now, how many months had gone by after he'd had this vision? 12 months. Another year, correct? We talked about this and we correlated this to the parable that Christ told about the tree. And we found out last night, in fact, after we had studied, that this tree had been given three years to bear fruit. Three years. That's very interesting. And uh, they were about to cut the tree down, but what was the word that was given? Spare it another year. And here we see Nebuchadnezzar, God at the, uh, God is trying to speak to him through this vision, and God gives Nebuchadnezzar a full another year to uh, accept the counsel, accept his counsel. But does Nebuchadnezzar accept his counsel? No, he does not. At the end of the uh, year we see him walking in the palace saying once again is 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 not this the great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty uh, Nebuchadnezzar's heart being lifted up against God this pride this self-exalting spirit manifesting itself in Nebuchadnezzar once again Nebuchadnezzar saying listen look at the works of my hands look at what I have done Look at all the righteousness that I have done, and this is acceptable before God as though it makes us perfect or as though it makes us great uh, in the eyes of God, but it does not. We see here, uh, this particular sentence here, real quickly, it says, His passion as a builder and his uh, signal success in making Babylon one of the wonders of the world ministered to his pride until he was in grave danger of spoiling his record as a wise ruler whom God could continue to use as an instrument for the carrying out of the divine purpose. So we see here uh, his, his, the works of his hands minister to his pride. We also see that the same pride existed in his grandson, uh, Belshazzar. And it's very interesting, brothers and sisters, because this is teaching us another lesson here, and that is the, uh, the lesson of hereditary tendencies. There is a uh, quotation in the Spirit of Prophecy, and, and uh, maybe in our next presentation I'll share it with you, but it's, it's, from the, it's in the book Great Controversy. And she says these words, she says that Satan is waiting to take advantage of our hereditary tendencies. You see, there are things in us that we have inherited from our parents, our grandparents, and so on and so forth, that some of us don't even know that it's there. But sometimes in certain situations, those things manifest themselves and we wonder, man, why, how, where did that come from? How did those things arise? And so it's very, we need to be very familiar with who we are. This is why the Bible says, and David says, we need to ask God to search us 
uh, to try us and know our hearts and know our thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in us. We don't want Satan to have an edge on us. We don't want him to take advantage of us uh, in this warfare that we have. Everything, we're, we're, we're battling the host of darkness, and so we need every advantage that we, that we can have. Amen? You know, we don't want Satan to steal a march upon us as the people of God. So we see that pride, the same pride that was in his grandfather, we see it existing in his grandson. We see that pride existing. Uh, for when you read Daniel chapter 5 in verse uh, 21, or actually 22, it says, And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. So he did not humble himself, even though he knew what took place with his grandfather, but his heart was lifted up as well. His heart was lifted up as well. So we're going to, in fact, the last slide that we looked at yesterday was this particular uh, slide. And we're going to pick up from here now as we continue to go forward. It says, what is justification by faith? None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. In the heavenly courts, there will be no so song sung to me that love myself and wash myself, redeem myself. Unto me be glory and honor, blessing and praise. But this is the keynote of the song that is being sung by many here in this world. In other words, pointing to self, pointing to the works, our righteousness, as though this makes us perfect in the eyes of God. It says they do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart, and they do not mean, and they do not mean to know this if they can avoid it. So notice, I want you to notice something here, just, just on this particular point, because it just came to my mind. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. And we all know this text. We know this text, but let's look at it in the Bible real quickly here. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to pick it up in verse 28. This is a text that I'm sure many of us have committed to memory. Once again, reading this, this line here, it says, They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart, and they do not mean to know it, to know this, if they can avoid it. Now, these individuals try to sing a song, and this, this, this is a song of pride to themselves, that as though they have done everything. And we know that in the Bible, there is a class of people in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 that say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name, correct? What does Christ say to them? What does he say? I never knew you, right? I never knew you. Now notice what this says here. This, this is why they didn't know Christ, and this is why Christ didn't know them. It says here in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 11, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We, we know this text, right? Then it says, Take my yoke upon you, and do what? Why? For I am meek and lowly in heart. What do we just read here? They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart. They do not know. Why? Because they have never come to Christ and what? Learned it. What does Christ say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. They never learned what it meant to be meek and lowly of heart. That's why Christ says, I don't know you. Yes, you've done these things. Yes, you've prophesied in my name. Yes, you've cast out devils in my name. But you never came to learn of me. I don't know you. If we come to Christ, if we are truly his children, we will learn to be meek and lowly just as Jesus was. We will walk. Our attitude, everything that is about us will reflect the meek and lowly Jesus. This is what God is telling us here. It says the whole gospel is compromised in learning of Christ. Oh, that's that's a powerful statement there. The whole of the gospel is compromised or is comprised of learning in Christ. It says his meekness and lowliness. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. This is what God has to do for us. This is what God did. For who? Nebuchadnezzar. God laid his glory in the dust. He uh, caused him to be among the beasts of the field. But as we continue to go forward here, I want you to notice uh, what your Bible says in the book of Daniel. We recognize that Babylon goes across, uh, goes off the scene. In fact, 
Before we read that, let me just look at these couple of statements here with you. Notice what this says here. It says, The image revealed to Nebuchadnezzar while representing the deterioration of the kingdoms of the earth in power and glory also fitly represents the de deterioration of religion and morality among the people of these kingdoms. This, this quotation was actually referenced this morning in the study that we had. It says, As nations forget God, in like proportion, they become weak morally. Uh, what causes us to forget God? Remember, we studied this yesterday. What causes us to forget God? We learned that, what, what was it? Okay, pride. Yes, yes. Love of the world. The Bible told us that, you know, when you have eaten and are full. The Bible said, remember we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 8. When you have eaten and are full. Prosperity. There we go. That's why Jesus warns us in Luke chapter 21. What does he say? There's a warning specifically for us. Luke chapter 21 and verse 34. What does it say? Hold your finger there in Daniel. Go there real quickly. This is why Jesus warns us. And, and it's not just here, but he warns us also in the book of 2 Timothy as well. Of the same thing. He tells us, he gives us a warning. This is a warning to God's last day church, his last day people. And this is the warning here in verse 34. It says, and take heed to yourselves or be, be warned. It says that lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. And what is that next thing there? And the cares of this life so that that day come upon you unawares. Christ says, don't be caught up with the cares of this life. We can be so busy that and caught up with the things of this life that we miss or we forget God. We forget what day that we're living in. We forget that we're supposed to be preparing our hearts and our homes for Christ's second coming. We see Babylon passed away because in her prosperity, there it is, she forgot God and ascribed the glory of her prosperity to human achievement. It's prosperity. The Medo-Persian kingdom was visited by the wrath of heaven because in this kingdom God's law was trampled underfoot. The fear of the Lord found no place in the hearts of the people. So who, what, what, what next kingdom comes upon the scene? We have what? Who? Medo-Persia, correct? How did the spirit of Gadal manifest itself in the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians? Notice what your Bible says in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. And when you get there, amen. Daniel, the sixth chapter, we see that it was the pride of Babylon, its prosperity that caused her to have this spirit of self-exaltation, this spirit of Gadol. Then we see that spirit getting worse and worse. As we studied this morning, the daily just continues to exalt itself. And we see here it manifesting itself in the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians in verse 15 of Daniel chapter 6. And notice what it says. The, then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be what? Change. Is that the spirit of Gadol? What is, that? What, is that? what is that known as? What do we call that? We call that infallibility, correct? Now, who is the only individual that's infallible? God. Only Christ is infallible. Only God is infallible. But we see here a kingdom manifesting the spirit of pride and self-exaltation in that, well, everything that we say is correct, right? But don't we do the same thing? Well, what I said is right. You know, I, I'm always right, right? I'm, I'm never wrong. What, what do you mean? My opinion is always right. This is the spirit of Gadol. This is the spirit of self-exaltation. We also see it in the book of Esther. Let's turn there quickly. Esther chapter 1. We see the spirit of Gadol, the spirit of self-exaltation in that there are individuals that believe that what no matter what they say, and we see it manifested here in the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, that they're always correct. They value their opinion greater than that, even, even that which is written. And it's sad to say uh, today, friends, that many people are doing the same things. Uh, the Bible says here in Esther chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, if it please the king, let there, be, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes 
that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And so we see here that the Bible says that it is written in the law, among the laws of the, of the Persians and the Medes, that it may not be altered. So once again, in the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, their uh, Gadol, the spirit of Gadol is manifested in that they uh, exalted their, uh, their laws, their uh, above the laws of God. Their laws could not be changed. Their laws could not be changed. Now, as we move forward in the kingdoms of men, what kingdom do we have next? What kingdom do we have next? Greece. And what was the... Or how did the spirit of Gadol manifest itself in Greece? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's all turn there. Notice what it says. We're going to the book of... Notice what it says here. In fact, we'll back up. Notice what this says here. We won't get too ahead of ourselves. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at verse 18. Let's begin there. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness. Foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is what? The power of God. Now, what, what is this whole study about? It's about the spirit of the daily, right? The principle of the daily, the spirit of pride, self-exaltation. What does the Bible say here? The preaching of the cross to them that perish is what? Foolishness. Foolishness. Why? Because what is, the cross, what is the cross all about? The cross is about exterminating the spirit of the daily. But to those that perish, this, this preaching right here is foolish. Okay? It goes on to say, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, in verse 22, what is it going to say? And the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, what was Greek or what was Greece symbolized by in the book of Daniel chapter 7? What were they symbolized by in Daniel chapter 7? What was Greece symbolized by? By a leopard, correct? What does the Bible say about a leopard? I would say, can a leopard change its what? Spots. Okay. We know that a leopard cannot change its spots. And we know that according to the scriptures, spots uh, are an indication of sin. Okay. Spots are equated to sin. And so what was the sin of Greece? Well, the sin of Greece, in fact, we'll, we'll notice what it is in the book of Acts chapter 7. 17, excuse me. Acts chapter 17. Notice what your Bible says here in Acts, the 17th chapter. We see that Greece is represented as a leopard. A leopard has spots. A leopard cannot change its spots. Spots in the Bible are equated to sin. What are this, or what is the sin, the chief sin, that we see this spirit of pride and self-exaltation manifesting itself in the kingdom of Greece? Notice what your Bible says in verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. It says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to what? Idolatry. Well, what was this idolatry? It says, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Now, where was Athens at before I go forward? It was in Greece. So Paul is in Greece here. Okay. So therefore he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain who? Philosophers and the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? And other some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them what? Jesus and the resurrection. 
And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Notice what the idolatry is in verse 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear what? Some new thing. So what was the, how did the spirit of Gadol or pride or self-exaltation manifest itself in the kingdom of Greece? It was their wisdom. It was their education. It was the philosophers. And many people today, brothers and sisters, you know, many people today, this is, this is what they do. You see this? I've, I've, I've arrived. I've gotten my diploma. And so... I'm therefore better than you are now because I know these things, right? In fact, the educational system of the world today is based on the spirit of Gadol. Did you know that? The grading system is based upon the spirit of Gadol. You know, when children, they, they take tests in school today, one asks the other student, well, what did you get on your test? Why? Because they want to feel exalted above the other. And we know that this is not the way of Christ. Christ desires that all would come to a knowledge of who he is. All would come to an understanding. But we see today in the world this spirit of Gadol being taught in the very educational system of the world that we live in. And not just the world that we live in, but even in our own churches and schools, this spirit is being taught. And many people believe that that because we've attained to this knowledge or we have an understanding of something that we're somehow better than other people are. That's the spirit of pride, self-exaltation. This is the, uh, uh, the spirit of Gadol or paganism. In fact, we're going to see this in, a, in our next quotation. This is the spirit of paganism. Notice what Sister White says here. This is in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 240, 239 and 240. Notice this. The Greeks sought after wisdom. Yet the message of the cross was to them what? Foolishness because they valued their own wisdom more highly than the wisdom that comes from above. Oh, brothers and sisters. I wish I put these quotations in here. There's some other quotations. But this is why John the Baptist, this is why Christ did not go to the schools of their day. Did you know that? This is why they didn't go. In fact, if you bear with me, just, just, just bear with me just, just a few more moments here. Just, I want to pull something up for you so you can see this real quickly here. Just give me a second I want, because I have to show you these quotations uh, on this. But notice this. It was the cross to them that perished was what? Foolishness. So that means, and it was by their wisdom, correct? Okay. So the educational system was teaching them what? What was it teaching them? It was teaching them that the religion that they believed in was what? Foolish. This is why you can have individuals that go to our educational systems that when they graduate, they're not Adventists anymore. They're atheists. Now, Brothers and sisters, I, I, I want to just say this here because I grew up in the Adventist system. I grew up going to school from the third grade, actually from the second grade, until I graduated in the Adventist system. And I have friends, friends, friends who I've gone to school with who today are Buddhists that were at school with me, went, went on through college, university, who are Buddhists, who are Hindus, who are atheists, who are all of these other things. And I sit and wonder, I said, well, man, if I were to go to medical school, somebody that goes to medical school, they don't graduate a trash man, do they? Do they? No. You, when you go to medical school, the purpose is to graduate and you're a doctor. But how do we have individuals who are going to Christian schools who are graduating atheists and Buddhists and, and all of these other things? It's because that which is being taught, which is being approved by, which has been approved by the world, which we know that 
our, our institutions and all Christian institutions today, the majority of them have the stamp of the approval of the government. This is being controlled by Rome. And Rome, well, we, we, we know what Rome's agenda is, and that is to turn everybody uh, back to Rome. Notice what these statements say here. Uh, this is speaking of John the Baptist, and I'm going to read one of Christ. Just notice what these, these things say. It says, in the natural order of things, the son of Zacharias would have been educated for the priesthood because his father was a priest, right? It says, but the training of the rabbinical schools would have done what? Unfitted, Unfitted him for his work. Who are we? Who are we, brothers and sisters? We're, we're, we're the third Elijah. We're another John the Baptist. We're to carry a more pointed testimony. Okay? Now, if we believe that history is repeating itself, then we have some things to consider here. It says, God did not send him to the teachers of theology to learn how to interpret the scriptures. That's interesting to me. Why didn't God do that? It says he called them. He called him to the desert that he might learn of nature and nature's God. Now, this, this is the most important. This is speaking of Christ here, this next quotation. Notice what it says. In the days of Christ, the town or city that did not provide for the religious instruction of the young was regarded as under the curse of God. Yet the teaching had become formal. Tradition had in a great degree supplanted the scriptures. True education would lead the youth to seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. But the Jewish teachers gave their attention to matters of ceremony. The mind, stop me if this, this, this sounds familiar. The mind was crowded with material that was worthless to the learner and that would not be recognized in the higher school of the courts above. The experience which is obtained through a personal acceptance of God's word had no place in the educational system. Notice what it goes on to say. It's not finished. Absorbed in the round of externals, the students found no quiet hours to spend with God. They did not hear his voice speaking to the heart. In their, in their search after knowledge, they turned away from the source of wisdom. The great essentials of the service of God were neglected. The principles of his law were obscured. That which was regarded as superior education. What are our schools called today? Yeah. Higher education, right? Yeah. That which was regarded as superior education was the greatest hindrance to real development. Under the training of the rabbis, the powers of the youth were repressed. Their minds became cramped. And narrow, and it goes on to say, if you read the paragraph right after that, it says, this is why Jesus did not attend the schools of his day. Okay? Information, worthless things, crowding the mind. Uh, in fact, brothers and sisters, we're going to learn something very quickly here in just a few moments as we continue our study. 69, Desire of Ages, page 69. But this is what the Greeks now... It's, the Greeks sought after wisdom, and this is what caused the Greeks to look upon the wisdom of the world, cause, causes one to look upon the cross of Christ and the preaching of the cross uh, to be foolish. Now, keep that in mind. Keep that in your minds. It says, in their pride of intellect and human wisdom may be found the reason why the gospel message met with comparatively little success among who? The Athenians. The worldly wise men who come to Christ as poor lost sinners will become wise into salvation. But those who come as distinguished men extolling their own wisdom will fail of receiving the light and knowledge that he alone can give. Thus, Paul met the what? Paganism, Paganism of his day. It's the daily. Exalting the wisdom of exalting their education above the wisdom and the teaching of the cross, the wisdom and teaching of God. This is the spirit of paganism. This is the spirit of the daily. Here we see manifested in the uh, exalting of uh, education in, in, in the kingdom of Greece. And so we have the pride of Babylon. We have the infallibility of the Medes and the Persians. And now we have the wisdom of the Greeks. 
But we know the power that comes after the Greeks. We know that it's pagan Rome. In fact, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Daniel chapter 8. Let's all turn there. And this is a text that we looked at today. I praise God for the study earlier. Uh, it was a blessing uh, because it really just solidified some things and really just uh, opened up other things as we were sitting there studying. It was a blessing. Uh, the Bible says here in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 11, it says, it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And we know that this he is talking about who? Those of you who are paying attention. This is pagan Rome, okay? So, yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. What we're looking at here and what we're just uh, identifying here is how pagan Rome magnified himself to the prince of the host. This is what we're looking at here. We know that it says in verse 25, looking at this particular verse, it says, and through his policy, uh, it says also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many, and he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. We recognize that the, it, was the, it was pagan Rome that stood up. Okay? This is how they magnify themselves. They stood up against the prince of princes. They stood up against the prince of the host. Well, when did that transpire? When did that take place? The Bible tells us in the book of Acts chapter 4. Let's all turn there to Acts the fourth chapter. Acts chapter 4, and we'll see it here. And I want you to, I want you to, because now I'm telling you to keep certain things in your mind because we're going to start really connecting some dots here as we get into the closing scenes. As we, we're, we're in them, but we're going to really start bringing some things together here. Notice what it says here in Acts chapter 4 and verse 26 and verse 27. It says here in Acts chapter 4, verse 26, it says, who? Number one, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So what did they do? They stood up against Christ. It says they, they magnify themselves to Christ. Now, who were the kings of the earth at that time? It was who? It was pagan Rome. That's who was in charge at that time. Verse 27, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were what? Gathered together. What do we see here in verse 27? We see a gathering together. But who is gathered together here? We see Herod. We see Pontius Pilate, we see the Gentiles, and we see the people of Israel. The people of Israel gathered themselves together. Did, did not, weren't, weren't the Jews saying, crucify him, crucify him? They, they gathered together to crucify Christ. They gathered together to magnify themselves against the prince of the host. It was the Jews and also Herod. It was the Jews and Pontius Pilate. Okay. Now, we looked at a presentation yesterday that was entitled, He Came Unto His Own and His Own Received Him Not. It's very interesting because after pagan Rome, we know that papal Rome comes into, into power here. But we're, 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 we're going to look at another nation before we look at papal Rome. Okay. We're going to look at the people of God. Because what we're going to see, brothers and sisters, is that all the characters, characteristics that we've looked at from heaven up until pagan Rome, they're all manifested in the people of God. You see them all. You see pride. You see the exaltation of wisdom. You see infallibility. You see... All of these things. Let's, let's notice what, our, what the Bible says here. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And brothers and sisters, this is simply written as a warning for who? For you and I. The Bible says whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for whose learning? Our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. God is trying to awaken us up and arouse us to make sure that this condition, this spirit of self-exaltation and pride that, exist, that existed in Satan, that existed in all these nations, does not exist in us. 
But notice what it says here in verse 15. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? What did they mean by that? What did they mean by that? How does Jesus know these things, having never gone to a school of theology? Right? He, he, he never went to our schools. How, does he, how is he so wise? We, we didn't train him. He didn't go, he wasn't trained by rabbi so-and-so and and this particular rabbi. How does he know these things without being formally trained? But once again, the reason why they're saying this is because they didn't believe that anybody could know or understand anything without them being able to teach them, right? In other words, our wisdom is superior to the Spirit of God. Because who teaches us? The Bible says it is the spirit of God that leads us and guides us into all truth. It is the spirit of truth that teaches us all things. But they believe that their system of education, that their wisdom was greater than that of God. And brothers and sisters, what did that, where did they, where did they go to school? Where, where, where did the Jews go to school? Those that train in the rabbinical schools, where did they go? Anybody know? They went to Alexandria. Where was that? Alexandria was in Egypt, right? Now, who ran that school? Who was that, in, who was that school influenced by? It was influenced by the Nazis, but it was in, influenced by the Greeks. That's where the Greeks set up. Ex, the Greeks actually set up the school in Ag, Alexandria. Isn't that where we get all the great philosophers of today? Who were the greatest philosophers? Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and the Greeks, right? And the Bible says, and in fact, we just read here that it was by the wisdom that the Greeks had that it caused them to look upon Christ and the sacrifice of Christ as what? Foolish. Let me ask you a question. Did the rulers in Israel, did the people in Israel, did they value the sacrifice of Jesus? Did they know who Jesus was? No, it was by their wisdom, the Bible tells us, that they knew not God. You see, that spirit of pride, and brothers and sisters, I'm just going to be plain and say this. I'm not going to just get off into it because I don't want to get too preachy here. I want to finish our study. But in Adventism today, that, that spirit of education is, it is ripe. I mean, it is there. That spirit of pride in what we know is all throughout our ranks. We believe that, hey, listen, oh, that person's a doctor. Oh, that person's this, that person's that. Oh, they're exalted. Have you guys ever done a study on what it means to pass through the fire? You know how the Bible says that people cause their children to pass through the fire? That's the system of education. When you study Sister White's writings, that's what she's talking about. She says those that made it through the fire, they were exalted among their people. As those that were special, as the children that were special, these, these were those who had attained to a higher sphere of education. Okay? And, the, and the communities and the peoples exalted these individuals. They said, look at them. They, they've done so great. It's the spirit of pride, the spirit of self-exaltation. How many people are precious in God's sight? Oh. Everybody. From the least to the greatest. God is no respecter of persons. And neither should we. We shouldn't, be, we, we shouldn't respect anybody. And this is one of the things that Christ, when he was on earth, he tried to teach his disciples. He tried to teach them, listen, don't respect people because of their position, of authority, because of who. Listen, you need to respect everyone. Everyone the same. Not be because somebody is poor and lowly do you overlook them. Or do you not, uh, not give up your seat to them. Those are the people that you should try to help the most. But here we see this spirit, the spirit of self-exaltation, manifesting, them, manifesting itself in uh, the people of God. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Many, many different texts that we can go to. Uh, many, many, many different texts that we can go to here. But for sake of time, uh, I'm not going to emphasize this point because we're going to see it a little bit later on in one of our presentations. <clears throat> but we see these, the same spirit, the spirit of pride, uh, self-exaltation manifesting itself in the spirit or in the people of God. Now it says here, just looking at one other point, uh, it says in verse 
1 of Matthew chapter 15. It says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they washed not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your what? Wasn't there a power that we read about that made laws against the laws of God? Wasn't that Medes and Persians? They exalted their traditions, their laws above the laws of God. We see that same spirit of self-exaltation here in manifesting or exalting the traditions of men above the laws of God. Just showing you, brothers and sisters, that these characteristics are found among us. And this is why we need to be very, very careful. Remember, what is, what's taking place right now? There's a controversy that's taking place, right? The controversy is over souls, the souls of men. There's a, a, a conflict, a battle. It's over our souls. And Satan is trying to plant his image, his superscription upon the hearts and minds of men. And God is trying to do the same as well. And we see the things that exist in the hearts of men here. Notice what this particular statement says here. It says, speaking about Rome, pagan Rome, and then we're going to fast forward here. It says, but the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. We see how... Pagan Rome made war against the saints of God and it magnified itself against the prince of the host. Moving forward, notice what this says. The people whom God had called to be the pillar and ground of truth had become what? who? Brothers and sisters, do we see that? So what does that mean? That's what we're talking about here. Whose name or character did they have? Satan's. Who is this talking about here? This is talking about the people of God. Those who were supposed to be the pillar and ground of truth had become the representatives, the ambassadors, the children of Satan. They were doing the work that he desired them to do, taking the course to misrepresent the character of God. There it is. And caused the world to look upon him as a tyrant. The very priests who ministered in the temple had lost sight of the significance of the service they perform. Now, were these people doing this knowingly? No. They were deceived. That's the thing. Remember, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that the devil deceiveth the whole world. Very deceptive power. It says they had ceased to look beyond the symbol to the thing signified. In presenting the sacrificial offerings, they were as actors in a play. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be swept away. Remember we talked about that yesterday. The king of the north came and swept away Israel in the time of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because the people were worshiping the things, the people were caught up in ceremony, in traditions. Then we have Christ coming, He's sending his messenger, sending John. And we see the same thing happening again. We saw, we compared and we saw how the message of John was the same as the message of Isaiah. And we saw how that the wrath to come that John preached about was uh, when in 70 AD when the king of the north would come again and destroy or sweep away the system that was there. We know that the king of the north is on the rise again. He's on the rise again and he is coming. Why? Because there are many people who are, what does it say? As actors in a play. What do we say? People that play church. They're playing church. That's what they do. They go Sabbath after Sabbath and they play church. They put on their Halloween costume. They get their little, their, the Bibles and they go to church. And instead of saying uh, trick or treat, what do they say? Happy Sabbath. Right? Isn't that what they do? Yes. Yeah, because they're playing. That's all they're doing. It's not real. Because when they go home, guess what? The costume comes off, the Bibles go down, and they go back to being 
who they really are. They're not studying their Bibles throughout the week. They're not praying as they should. They're not seeking uh, 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 the guidance of God. They're not doing any of those things. People, listen, they forget God. And one day a week they come in and worship him and, you know, have fun. And even they don't even, not even one full day because after church, they go back to being who they are. But then we have the next kingdom that comes upon the scene as we move forward here. And as we begin to wind this down, uh, we're, we're going to, this is going to lead us into our next, next study here. Who's the next kingdom that comes up after pagan Rome? Well, it's papal Rome. And what is the chief attribute of the papacy? What is the chief attribute of the papacy? Number one, we know that the papacy is a combination or a union of church and state. It is a combination of compromise. Okay? Compromise is where we see this spirit of Gadol manifesting itself. But even greater than that, in fact, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 7. Daniel the seventh chapter. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And let's look at verse number 25. The Bible tells us these words. In fact, verse 21, and then we'll read verse 25. It says, I beheld and the same horn made what? War with the saints and prevailed against them. Verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. What do we have taking place here? We have the papacy. Uh, the papacy's job here, or the papacy's, the characteristics of the papacy is to make war with the saints. Okay. We see here that the papacy's, uh, one of their characteristics is that they speak great words against the Most High. We, we know that they, what, what are those great words called? The great words are called what? Blasphemy. blasphemy. And what, are, what is one of those blasphemy? What is one of the, uh, uh, what, what, is, what is a blasphemy that the Bible speaks of? When a man claims to be, yes, forgive sins, but when a man also claims to be God. When a man claims to be God, okay? Hold that thought in your mind. One of the chief attributes of the papacy is to make war with the saints. Brothers and sisters, this is how the spirit of Gadol is manifested in the papacy, exalting itself. Don't we find Cain doing this? Cain makes war against Abel, his brother. Let me ask you a question. Is there a war in the house of God? Do we see people, even among God's people, making war against one another? And I'm not just talking about against the message. I'm not just talking about because I, I really want to make this very practical. Whenever there's conflict and strife among us, that's the, that's the spirit of the papacy. Because there should be no conflict. There should be unity and harmony uh, for the sake of truth and for the sake of Christ among God's people. Now, we know that, yes, we're in a warfare, we're in a battle, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay? In other words, we're not using harsh words. We're not using uh, uh, mean looks. We're not using uh, dirty or uh, attitudes or uh, different things. We're not thinking bad thoughts. Those are not the weapons of our warfare. Okay? Those are carnal weapons. The warfare that we're in is a spiritual warfare, and the spiritual weapons that we have are what? The Word of God, faith, righteousness, prayer. These are our weapons. This is how we fight, right? So when somebody's making war on us, we don't jump out and accuse them or be mean to them or put them down in any way. What do we do? We say, well, brother, let, let me show you something here in the Word of God. Or, man, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I'll pray for you. You know, or we might even say, I'll pray for them. Some people are offended by that. Oh, you're going to pray for me. Oh, I need prayer. Just pray for them, right? Because that's the spirit of God. Oh, I don't need prayer. You know, or if somebody tells us that, you know, we get offended. Oh, I'm going to pray for you, brother. What? Pray for me? I don't need prayer. Oh, when somebody says they're going to pray for me, no matter who it is, I say, you know what? Pray for me. 
because I'm not above God. I'm not above sin. Okay. We see here war against the saints. War against the saints. The papacy makes war against the saints. And we have to, brothers and sisters, we have to make sure that we as the people of God are not doing the same thing. That we're not making war against people because of our own selfish desires or motives. Notice what this says. The masterpiece of Satan says these words. It says, the compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of what? The menace. Now, embrace this with me. Think about this now. The compromise between what? Paganism and resulted in the development of who? Foretold in prophecy as opposing and doing what? Exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece. What is a masterpiece? The compromise between paganism and Christianity is a masterpiece of the power, of Satan's power, a monument. What, what is another word for a monument? Landmark, sign, ensign, right? Okay. Of his efforts to seat himself upon the what? Throne to rule the earth according to his will. What did Satan wanted to, what did he want to do initially in heaven? He wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. But where did he also want to sit? He wanted to sit also upon the congregation in the sides of the north. How does he accomplish this, brothers and sisters? Through the compromise of paganism and Christianity. That's how he sits upon the congregation in the sides of the north. We often like to think, well, yes, this is the papacy. This is Rome masquerading as Christianity. But brothers and sisters, who is the man of sin? Well, we learned just a few moments ago, wasn't the man of sin in the time of Christ? Mm -hmm. Didn't we just read that the people who were the expositors of truth had become the representatives of Satan? Didn't we just read that? Mm -hmm. Didn't Christ say to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you are of your father, the devil? Was it, isn't it true, brothers and sisters, that the compromise between paganism and Christianity existed in God's own people. Did it not? Weren't, I mean, <laughs> did it? Yes, it did. There was a compromise between, because what is this really? What, what is this all about? Remember, Satan had inscribed his character upon those who were supposed to be carrying forth the truths of God's word. And we know that those, we learned this last night, one of the things that we learned last night in Revelation chapter 17, those that receive the mark of the beast are those that have the name of the beast, the Bible says in Revelation 13 and verse 17. Well, what is, what is name synonymous with? We know that those that follow God have the Father's name written in their foreheads. Name is synonymous with character. So those that have the mark or receive the mark of the beast have the name of the beast. Well, they have the character of the beast. This character was seen even before the papacy was around. Where is it seen? Among God's people. That's why, what does Paul say? He says, the mystery of iniquity doth already, it's already working. It's already at work. It was already working. And we see this, this, this union. And that's why it's important, brothers and sisters. In fact, notice what your Bible says. Turn, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's look at this because this is where our next study is going. This is where our next study is going because we're looking at the closing scenes in the life of Christ. We're seeing that... I, I need to end with this, this particular uh, uh, statement here or this particular scripture here and then we'll pick it up in our next study. But notice what this says here. We'll end with this, this, this statement. Uh, this text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and let's look at verse, uh, let's look at verse, let's look at verse, let's look at verse 3 and 4, and then we'll come back and re revisit this in our next presentation. 
It says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. What is, what, what is a falling away? What's that word in the Greek? It's apostasy. That's what, that's what apostasy means. Apostasy means falling away. Okay. So for that day shall not come except there come apostasy. Or falling away first that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now what does this son of perdition do? Who exalteth, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Well, Let me ask you a question brothers and sisters. Was there a son of perdition before the papacy came around? Yes, there was. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Notice what your Bible says here. Notice what your Bible says, brothers and sisters. See, this is something that we need to understand and recognize. And I'm not, I'm, I dare not, I'm not pointing the fingers at anybody. I'm pointing the fingers at myself. You see, because I can be the man of sin. I can because what is the temple of God today? We are. We know that Christ says that Christ, he is to be Lord, our Lord and Savior. He is to reign over us. He is to sit upon the throne of our hearts. But when we're sitting on the throne of our hearts, what are we doing? We're opposing and exalting ourselves above all that is called God. It says here in John chapter 17 and verse 12, are we all there? It says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. I kept, kept, uh, kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but who? The son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Who was the son of perdition in the day of Christ? Judas. Judas. Was Judas a Catholic? Now the church wasn't even around then. But what made Judas the son of perdition? It was the compromise between paganism and Christianity. It was the spirit of Gadol, the spirit of self-exaltation, the spirit of pride. We're going to see in just a few moments in our next study what happened to Judas. We're really going to study it and we're going to see what Christ did, how he endured, what he did with Judas to see how we as God's people, number one, are to be overcomers so that we're not like Judas, but also as well how we're to deal, uh, deal with individuals who we may see have these traits or characteristics. And so with that, brothers and sisters, let us, let us have a word of prayer. Our gracious and eternal Father, once again, Lord, as we humbly come before you, Lord, we recognize that this is the great testing time. We're living in the time of the shaking, the sifting of your people. And Father, we know that even now that you are trying to impress your character, your image upon mankind. Father, I pray that you would give us humble hearts. I pray that the spirit of pride, the spirit of self-sufficiency, which you have said through your prophet is the most hopeless of all sins, the most hopeless and the most incurable. Lord, I pray that this, this spirit would not be manifested in us, whether it be because of our own opinions, our education, our wisdom, uh, our pride, whatever it may be, Lord, wherever we are manifesting the Spirit, Father, I pray that you would give us humble hearts. Please, Lord, help us not to uh, value anything of ourselves above what you have given us and, and the power that you have given us. Even now, Father, we just continue to ask and pray that your Spirit would abide with us and that you would continue to guide us in our studies as we study today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen.